Hello and welcome to the Build a Soil YouTube channel. Today is a big day. We're flipping the flower. It's episode 15 and it's been a long time coming. If you've been following along for season four, there's been a lot of delays in us getting to this point. In fact, the area I'm standing in has already been fully flowered and auto flowers all harvested except for one. And so uh, today is day 79 from seed of the Marathon OG, the last one, and it's the best one. And so I've got it pulled out. I wanna be able to show you on camera, show you the other tent, and today we're gonna to be flipping the flower, not only this, but our males, and we're gonna start collecting pollen. I may not be able to use the pollen this round. It's possible we'll do some lowers, and once we harvest, let those seeds mature, more than likely we'll be just collecting the pollen and saving it for the next round so we can make some seeds, maybe do a giveaway with Patreon. I just wanna have fun with it. We're not trying to be a breeder. Clearly we're just taking pollen and we're chucking it on some plants and making some seeds. But one of the things I wanna do is show you that that's really rewarding. You don't have to be a breeder locking down traits. You can just say, I like this, I like that. I put them together, let's see if I like what is made. And from there, it could spark the interest to actually make you want to be a real breeder when you start learning about genetics and how to isolate. And it's pretty unbelievable what you can do in a short period of time with plants when you're guiding towards an actual goal. Just like humans, having a goal is very important and also having fun is important. So they're, they're two separate things, but I think you should be able to do both. The other thing I wanna to do today is give you a walkthrough. I've started defoliating the auto pot area because I need to, it's clearly overgrown like a jungle. Last time you saw it, we were correcting a little bit of tip burn issue that I think we've fully overcome. I'll explain what I think was responsible for it, how we turned it around and what I would do differently next time using the auto pots so I don't encounter it. But there's some more research I'd like to do. I'd like to send our water off to get a sample. When we're running a smaller container and lots of water, it does seem to be slightly more like hydro. And so I wanna make sure that I do my best learning it so that I can teach you. And so we'll probably do another round in this setup. As I've said, one caveat, we've never done auto pots before. This is not our normal style. So don't copy everything we do, rather watch and then decide at the end if it was worth it or if you can make improvements from it. This is our typical style, but not everybody wants to be in large grow beds. So normally we show you some earth boxes, We've done seven gallons, five gallons, 15 gallons, all sorts of different container sizes under different methods to show you that all of it works and none of it doesn't. If you do nothing, that won't work. So all of it works, none of it doesn't. It's kind of an old saying, but when it comes to these beds, you just need to put the time in. The results are pretty clear. There can be some issues that as you go through experience, you'll get better at. Did I overwater? Did I underwater? It's kind of the main one. And the whole part of this method is to be transparent in teaching. Let's do a walk around briefly tell you what I'm gonna get after. Then I'm gonna go show you the autoflower plant because it's beautiful. I wanna discuss exactly how we grew it because it's probably the simplest grow we've ever done with the least amount of effort and I was gone most of it. So if I can do that, you should be able to duplicate it on your first round, have phenomenal herb and a good yield. Then I wanna show you the males. I'm gonna show you the timer old school that I'm gonna use and discuss how I'm gonna kind of break a lot of environmental rules for my males because I don't want any pollen flying into this tent. Then what I'm gonna do is we're gonna come back in here and I'm gonna finish the episode with a tutorial on the build a soil way, environmental control, and flipping to flower. To do that, I've got a couple things that you can download. I printed them in black and white, which I shouldn't have done. They look way better in color. But I've got the build a soil 2022 feeding schedule. I've got the build a soil DLI chart, which we'll make available for download. And on the feeding chart, the most important is the environment. And so I'm gonna read these out loud. I'm gonna tell you where we should have been some things that actually affected the grow in here related to the environment and how I've improved it. And most importantly, we're gonna follow it to the T when it comes to flipping the flower. Now that I'm not leaving town, I'm here for the duration, I'm getting in a good routine, I wanna show you what you should be doing. And I'm gonna go through the exact schedule on here and show you what I'm doing today as part of that schedule and mention what I'll be doing in the near future. Then we're gonna go through and wrap it up in here. I'm actually gonna open up my phone pull on the app that controls my whole tent in here, the Niwa app. It's plugged into a smart controller and I'm gonna change the recipe to be 12 hours of light instead of 18 hours of light. I'm gonna change the humidity and the temperature triggers according to this chart and then I'm gonna hit the button. You'll see all the lights go off, come back on and I'll say, that's it. We've now flipped to flower. The lights right now go off at midnight. When we're done, they're gonna go off at 6 p.m. and they're gonna come on at 6 a.m. Only thing I haven't thought, which I'll do on camera is, when is the next time change? Will it matter to me? And right now I can think it's not coming. We, are, we just had a time change, so I'm safe. So let's do it. I've got quadrant one is obviously empty. I'm gonna show you the autoflower in just a second. Here is quadrant two. 
from afar, you can tell it looks reminiscent of the Branson's Royal Revenge, which I heard somebody just won a cup with, which is pretty cool. So that's pretty rad. And a lot of that journey started here because Branson's an employee, Dave's a breeder, we ran him here. It's like, we want that whole process to be part of the team. And so when I look at this bed, what I mean reminiscent is you see these huge leaves and shorter growth. This one over here, it's busting at the seams. I've over vegged it, so to speak, meaning I may run out of room. I can put another net on. I'm confident I'll figure it out, but this is what beds do. But I don't know what to expect as far as stretch. Just out of appearance, I'm expecting it to double. I think it's gonna be crazy. I don't think these are gonna stretch much. At least this time I could fill it, but really I'd kind of like to get this busting through clean it up low and make sure that if these don't stretch, I'd like to veg that maybe a week or two longer. And I can might get those to shine a little bit better. But I'm guessing those aren't the Bransons. This is the Royal Black Dog Kush. And that is from Rootwise. And it does have Canyon Queen in it, which has Long Valley. And that's part of Bransons. And so that's why I'm bringing it around kind of full circle to what I'm recognizing. Either way, I just want to show you last time that you saw this, we fully defoliated it and it looked like the bed was empty. Well, the magnolia is crushing it. It literally blew the whole bed back up again. I've got a top that I've been outside completely and it's like over here just branching, it's going nuts. So what I'm gonna do today when we turn off the camera, when we're done after changing the environment, I'm gonna go through and do one last defoliation. There's some leaves that have been rubbing on each other that have got some moisture buildup. There's some leaves that are just pointless. There's some lowers down here that have regrown. I don't need those, I'm gonna cut that off. So I'm gonna control it to the space that I want. I'm gonna clean up everything below the screen up so that it's basically empty. Everything else above, I'm gonna take some of these big fans off. The only thing about this bed, it's gonna look empty again when I'm done because most of that is leaf. However, I think it's gonna be necessary and I think it's gonna do really well once we finish that. Over here, I'm not so worried. I just think it's gonna be a jungle. I still have some defoliation to do, but like, look at how healthy these are. Just peak health. This number three is just pushing everywhere. Out the side, I'm glad I put tr side trellis because that'll help support these big buds that are gonna pop. But I'm probably gonna have to take some of the lowers off that are way low. And it's hard because this is a big bed. I'm gonna have that back plant there. Once I clean out these three, I'm gonna be like climbing in there, taking out lower leaves, mainly because I don't want any lowers back there to just lack light, start to die and be a source of contamination or a source where there's not as good of airflow. Another thing I may do, since this is a big bed, is they make those AC Infinity little tiny flans, the clip fans, they're really nice, best clip fan we've carried. I've considered clipping one on here in the back corner and keeping some airflow underneath the canopy. I always want you to consider that. I've got one fan running here, it's moving air around, and I've got one fan up there that's moving high. You'll notice it's not really directly blasting on the plants. Last time we had the Northern Lights here, this fan was kind of hitting some of the tops pretty hard. And <laughs> Greg even reached out and he's like, dude, the wind speed's too high. I think wind's okay, but you'll notice when you grow indoors, when you have the same wind hitting the same plant all day, you get some wind burn. And so you wanna make sure airflow is considered. We'll discuss that as we get into the environment. I'll point out all the little things. There's an air intake over there that I'm gonna to wanna to mention. I have an exhaust. And as I set the parameters in here, I'll explain how you can, if you don't have an intake and you don't have all the things, even without, how can you get your environment dialed? Even if it's partially manual, like you unzip a tent in the morning or you do these little things, you can slowly get your environment closer to the goal. Now, when you have multiple things that you'd wish to change, like you might need to buy an air conditioner or a humidifier, and you can't do that this round, you wanna focus on the weakest link, the things that are gonna make the biggest impact. And each round you can dial in, as they call it, by getting your parameters a little bit better. So without further prolonging, I like to talk. Let's go look at the Autoflower, the Marathon OG. Follow me. Found my coffee. <laughs> the lighting in here is not the best, but I just wanted to show you how beautiful it is. Day 79 Autoflower from Daz. And this is the Marathon OG. And it's the most unique. I, I swear it looks like the strawberry milk and cookies. But um, God, it's so sticky. The reason I wanted to show you this on camera is the GoPro doesn't do the best in close-ups, right? You'll be able to see the size, but I wanted you to relate that this is one of the least managed grows. You can tell because it's kind of floppy. I've got some wires holding it. We did nothing. I put a seed in here, I transplanted it, and this that was so small, it didn't trigger in its cup. So when I transplanted it, it was unaffected by that. And it literally went through its normal veg cycle into its auto flower with perfection. Today's day 79 from seed, which is exactly as it should be. And it's one of the prettiest, stinkiest, greasiest flowers we've grown in there, auto flower or not. It fades beautiful. And here's what we did. Build a soil base blend recipe in the earth box. Top dressed, you can watch, we did it. Craft blend and build a flower immediately because it's our base blend. 
that's it. We put filtered hose water down there. When I left town and Dave and Kevin, the guys were here, they just literally put the hose down there when it was empty and that's it. I came back, the plant was still doing well. I continued to add water. I did nothing else and this is what we got. And this, mind you, we haven't even started flowering yet. This all happened in an extra area while we were getting the rest of the 10 by 10 ready to flower. So we're still gonna keep quadrant one going. We're gonna do another round of autos. Now, it's not gonna be ideal because it's gonna be under 12-12. It should certainly be under 18 hours or 20 hours of light. But I've got an empty quadrant. I might as well throw my earth box. I'm literally gonna put a seed back in the same soil. I'm not gonna throw it away. I'm gonna put hose water down. I'll probably scrape the top, I'll show you when I do it. We'll put a new top dress on and that's it. This time I'll probably directly sow the seed and we're gonna do a whole nother round of autos for the Build a Soil YouTube series, season four, second round of auto flowers in quadrant one. So look for that coming soon. Oh, I'll snap some pictures. I already shared it on an Instagram this morning so you can see what I'm looking at. It's just beautiful. Great job, Daz. Thank you for the fire gear. I really did not think I'd ever be growing autos, but if they keep, turning out like this, I will continue to do it. Let's take a peek over here. This is the auto pot watering system. This is the Flexi Tank Pro. I really like it. If you had it in your grow room, it reflects the light. It keeps the temperature a little bit more insulated. I did something different that we're not supposed to do, but this is my version of it, right? And so I took Eric's product, the Yahweh, which is a fermented kefir whey, basically. So if you make your own labs, you could try that. But Alan with Grokashi, he used to make either labs or he'd make like a kvass, he'd soak his kashi and then he'd make a tea from it and he would put that in his earth boxes and a lot of people still do that. I know Pedro grows, he grows for hash and a lot of earth box growers love it for that but he puts EM1 in the reservoir. The idea is that it's stagnant, it's not full of air. That's why I didn't add the air stone and the faculty of anaerobes, the ones that can be anaerobic or aerobic, they can benefit the root zone. So if you take a look in here, it's all yellow from the way we actually dumped in the Yahweh straight in there and that's being plumbed into the root system and so far the plants are raging on it. So I'm hoping that keeps things clean there. I've got a lot to learn. It could funk up and cause a problem. The good thing about this reservoir and the way I set it up, super easy to flush. I've got a quick connect here. I've got an open valve at the other end. So I did it as a gamble. I thought to myself, if it doesn't work, I'll flush it. I'll put it back in there with clean water. They've got so much soil, they'll be fine. But I'm happy to report it's working really well. So we'll keep updating. Don't copy me. Just Watch a little longer and we'll see how it works. This is the reservoir for the humidity system. This had the moms, it's gone, it's empty now. We were able to get a clone off of all of those plants except for the Soleil Levon one and two. Those were actually rooting and I cleaned out my cloning tray and I was supposed to only discard all the other ones that I had backups of and I, I tossed the one and two and then I couldn't pick out which was which. So I just ditched them. I've got everything except for the Soleil Levon one and two, which if it turns out to be a winner, I can re-veg or I can pop more seeds. I know the breeder, we went to his house, and so it is what it is, but otherwise we've backed up every clone I'll show you in there. And then this is the males. We have not been talking about this. They've been here the entire time. Like literally we've got Pacalola one and Northern Lights five in here. I don't think we have a beefcake. I think we've got one Pacalolo, no, two Pacalolos and one NL5. I'm gonna flip these to flower. We're gonna collect some pollen off of here. I've got the timer and I'm gonna do it right now. Right now it's on 18.6. The time of the day, what time is it right now? It's 12.09 right now. So these are 15 minute increments. It's pretty easy to set. I've also got it where you can see it's on for 18 hours and then it's off. And so off is these little black switches if you use one are pushed up and on is when they're pulled down. All the tabs are done. It's on, not on on, I have it on timer. So it's gonna run on the timer. And now that I've got the time right, it's at 12, 10, 12, 15 ish. I'm gonna go plug the light into this right now. You can see I've got a compost tea brewing. We're gonna discuss some of the differences. I'm gonna give this tea to these plants because they're needing to be fed. In fact, let me show you before I flip the timer. They've been held back. I've hacked these back, I wanna say four or five times. I went to the point where I was out of town, they were yellow and necrotic, and then we top dressed them and flipped them. We even had some gnats show up because right out this back door, we have a whole pile of stuff. I ended up top dressing the whole thing with a solid layer of Montana grow. It completely obliterated it. The plants loved it. And then we just top dressed on top of that and kind of mixed it in. And it's been one of the easiest dad tents I've ever kept. Now, there's no airflow in here. The lights are on very low, so it's been easy to keep them happy. But now that I want to collect pollen, I want them to be very healthy. I'm going to feed them with the tea. I'm going to top dress a little bit. We'll show you as I do that in the future. The tea in here is just four cups of build a flower and a couple ounces of organic gem liquid fish. And it's just bubbling. And that's all that's in there. It's a very basic tea. I'm gonna bubble that for 24 hours, feed it to them. I'm gonna brighten the light up. 
just a little bit. Might as well do it right now. Just a little bit, okay? And that's gonna keep the heat under control because here's what I'm not gonna do. I'm not gonna set any environmental parameters in here, mainly because I want no exhaust, no intake, I want no movement. You can tell this pollen sacs right here, they're already opening, see those? This particular one has been throwing sacs out the entire time. Just like a female will have little pistols even when you're not flowering, there'll be a couple of sacs on some plants. Now when I go full blown flower, I don't want this little piddly pollen. I wanna develop like nugs of pollen in there, giving me full mature pollen. To do that, I want them to be mid-cycle or mature when I actually collect it. So the pollen could go in the tent and it could ruin everything. But I don't want you to be scared. With a little bit of moisture and no airflow, you could have a tent right here with pollen and it should not pollinate the other grow. We'll tell you what happens, but we're gonna do it right here. I'm gonna flip the flower. I have no exhaust, no intake. I'm gonna flap all the flaps closed. I'm gonna keep the light low and it won't be the healthiest, most vigorous grow like we grow flowers, but all we're gonna do is collect pollen out of here. So the lack of air movement is not ideal, but with low light, I won't need as much fresh air because I'm not gonna be driving them to grow that fast. And that'll slow down kind of nutrient use. It'll make them easy for me to keep healthy. And then we'll document the point at which we collect pollen. To make sure I get pollen off each one, at that point, I'll probably pull and separate the plants. And then I'll make sure we're getting pollen off that plant instead of like a mixed pollen batch from what might be in there. Then I'll show you how we store it and save it for later use and eventually we'll get to the point where I show you how I apply it to certain branches, label the branches so I can come back later and collect those seeds. It's really easy. There's a few caveats, like we wanna tell you, get mature pollen. We also wanna give you the timing where you don't wanna go through a pollen on their day one of flower, and you don't wanna do it day 50 of flower. There's some times that make sense to get fully mature seeds, slightly different from getting just mature flower. We'll go over the basics because I'm not an expert and I'll make sure I hit the high notes so that you can start to do your own research if this is something that's interesting to you. The good news is once you start doing this, you have unlimited seeds, free seeds that you made for yourself that you can barter with your friends and it starts the beginning of a collection. And I think what you make is more valuable than what you buy. Just like when we wanna grow our own, there's something unique about the, the ability to choose our own things instead of just what everybody gets us and I wanna share that with you. So, and then here's the light. I'm gonna undo it, I'm gonna plug it in and then I'm gonna put it in this top ones and plug it back in. That's it. I just flip this to flower and this will start the process of the plants, the males going into flower so we can collect the pollen. As we do, do this, I'll spend a more dedicated episode discussing it, but for today, I just wanted to mention we're starting. Also wanted to mention that Montana grow tip because literally I, I just covered it in Montana grow and it 100% stopped the gnats and got really vigorous growth out of the plants. Only concern I had was like the wet Montana grow right on the stalk, but I kind of shied it off at the stock there and it seemed to work wonders. So maybe try that. I showed you the autoflower. You can take a quick peek in here. We're about to kick this off and we haven't done it yet. We're gonna put house plants in here, fruit trees, rare plants, all sorts of stuff. But back there is where we rooted all the different genetics we have. We're about to flip the flower. So if one of them turns out to be good, we've got all the fruit by the funks, we've got all of the royal black dog kush, and I've got almost all the soleils, despite a stupid mistake. But healthy plants root easily. I literally threw them in there, rooted them up in the normal build a soil method we've showed you in the orange tray with the Floriflex pucks and we got all of them to root. So that's pretty cool. Let's get going. Let's go in the environment. Come on in here. Let's grab the chart. So here is the build a soil schedule. You can find this by going to buildasoil.com. On the top, there's some links. There'll be one that says educational. When you click on that, the first one says the growing system. Click on that, it has a whole explainer about the basics of the build a soil principles. At the very bottom, there's a PDF with full color on here. If you click it, it's a downloadable PDF you can print. I just went to fit on my single sheet and hit print, so it printed on one page. In here, the most important, at the top, it discusses the method, so let me read it real quick. Soil, minimum 15 gallon pots. We broke the rule here. This is like a five to seven gallon. I just think that you can do whatever you want. 15s is where the easy begins. 15 to 30 just crushes. 30 is like the easiest grow. Then big beds, add one variable because now you can overwater in a big way where 15s and 30s are slightly more forgiving. But once you crack that code, beds are like, no problem. Next, cover crop. Put a, a teaspoon uh, per square foot. Really, we're just trying to sprinkle it like salt and pepper, small amount. We did that, but then in the last video, I went and smothered it and top dressed it in Kooko, right? And here it did the same thing. Some of the cover crop's still going, so we're following what we teach across the entire way. I just don't in every episode pull this out. I probably should. Kashi blend, spread an eighth of a cup per plant. That helps break down the mulch layer, break down the craft blend, break down all the chop and drop cover crop. So we recommend some sort of probiotic. 
on the right hand side here, if you don't have each of these ingredients, we listed what it is so you can use what you have. Like we mentioned, J Plant Speaker. Well, if you don't have the Qyaha, just use a wedding agent. If you don't have the RootWise, make sure you get some mycorrhizae. Of course, you'll come to find you need to buy like seven products to replace RootWise, which is why we recommend it. But I always wanna teach where you don't have to buy any of this stuff. You might be in another country watching. Read this side and it'll tell you, wedding agent, mycorrhizae, micronutrients, all around soil amendment, compost for the mulch layer, a probiotic amendment, a foliar spray for IPM, an amino acid to boost growth, biology for blooming, Everything's listed so that if you don't have the exact one, you can go find something in your marketplace, in your country that loosely fits that. And I think that you'll have all the building blocks to complete your puzzle, if that makes sense. So seedlings are rooting cuts. This is recommendations during this phase of its life. We go over the environment, the temperature, the intensity of the light, the length of the daylight. And so all those are important. And if you watch some of our past episodes, I get really into it. It's, it's something that's an entire like ecosystem that you have to get into your mind how one thing like a Rubik's cube will adjust another. You can't just move one, like everything you change is connected. It's, it's a whole web of life. So when we adjust the light daytime to 12 hours, now we can increase the potency of the light. And that's related to DLI. So I'll get there, I have a whole separate chart. But for now, I just wanna get at, there's seedlings or rooting cuts, there's a vegetative stage, which we've been in for a while, pre-bloom, the week before flower. And so I normally do a defoliation or I make sure things are clean. The week before flower, we wanna do some sort of top dressing, which I didn't, these are pretty big beds and we just re-amended. I may follow through with that, but certainly here we did. Main reason is if your plant is bigger than your container, you're gonna to have to top dress, like you're gonna run out of steam. If your container is bigger than your plants, you're probably fine. This is almost even. That's about the max veg I would go for a bed that big. The beds like that have a lot of horsepower, so I think it's gonna be more than fine. The goal with the build a soil way though is, I don't wanna deplete that bed. So I'm gonna do some top dressing just to make sure the next cycle's good. But this cycle, it's more than good. Here's where we're at. Bloom transition or the stretch phase, which is weeks one through four. Some plants stretch the first two weeks, some go two to three weeks, some go a little longer. The stretch you'll notice when you start to grow is what we call it because the plants will be this size when I change it to 12 hours of light, they're gonna hormonally shift into flower and they're gonna go and just completely jump in size. Not every plant does it. This one may only go up to about here where these might double to triple. If they start going triple, I'm gonna run out of room. So what I'll have to do is put another layer of scrog and start bending the height over. And so what you can do is take something that would be tall and start to crisscross it so that you have good buds without wasting your vertical height. That's something you really have to learn in micro grows, but with a height extender tent, we normally don't have the issue. The challenge is, is I now have a magnolia. You want the distance to be about 18 inches away, 12 to 18 inches. With the cypress, I could grow right into it, but then I wouldn't have as good penetration. These penetrate better, but I don't wanna to be to the ceiling with my plants that tall. I wanna keep them 12 to 18 inches so I get the spread. So my main goal will be managing this beast. It's just, I mean, it's pushing everywhere. So. We'll, we'll discuss that as we go because we'll, we'll get to do that on camera as they stretch. And since I've not run these genetics, I don't know exactly what to expect. Also, it could be a problem here. I mean, I'm gonna probably have to put another layer on here because if these go auto pot style, I mean, like an earth box, they could just jump, jump when I flip the flower. So here's what it says. Bloom transition weeks one through four. You wanna be on 12 hours of light. Now, normally what I do is we start at seedings or, rootling, seeding, seedlings or rooted cuts at 20 hours of light. You can do 18 or 20, it doesn't matter. But then when I get into veg, I like to go to 18 hours, six hours, 18 hours on. Then as I get a pre-bloom, a lot of times I'll switch to 16 hours, kind of stair-stepping them. I didn't do that this time. I prefer to. If you know you're gonna flip next week, you can top dress, switch the light down a little bit, and it kind of stair-steps it a little more like nature. That's why that's in there. Then what we do is from 16, eight, we go now into flower to 12, 12. I'm just gonna go from 18 hours like it is now, straight to 12, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you wanna do the 16 hour trick, that's great. At the end of flower, we actually take it further. We go 11 hours on and 13 hours off as we get into the, the finishing phase, the ripening phase. But for stretch, we want 12 hours, okay? And the next line item on here is PPFD. PAR is what most people call it, the light intensity. When you add the D in there, the PPFD, it's at a certain distance. And so the light intensity, you wanna be able to measure when we're in seedlings, like two to 300. When you're in veg, five to 600. When you're in pre-bloom, 550 to 700. When you go into full flower, 900 to 1400. I think less is more. I like to be closer to that 900 when I'm in flower. 1400, certain genetics can really take it if you've got everything humming. 
but I feel like the desire to push, push really hard lowers quality. And I think it's easier to hit a target quality window in that 900 par range. So if you're new to this, follow the lower recommendations on light. If you're more experienced and you wanna try and just put the gas pedal a little more, you can crank up the lights. But if you start to see issues that are on the top only and not anywhere else, you might have to back off the lights. Part of what was exacerbating the issue with the, with the box here is we have a really potent light and I kind of had it cranked thinking, man, it needs to go through all that water it's using. Well, I had tons of airflow coming in and it was a little bit cooler than it should have been in here. Cooler means the biology can't release the nutrients as well. Light was a little bit intense and so it started to add to that tip burn. Well, dimmed the lights a little bit, got the top dress where it can keep up and kept it moist. Now we have feeder roots. I mean, look at this. Feeder roots popping through just like I talked about pushing through the coca, furry, just doing their job eating food. And now they'll take more and I've got an idea I'm gonna try. I actually brought some organics alive in here and I'm gonna grab this box and I know it's water soluble, but my buddy Alex from Kowoko, he says, dude, you take a little of this powder and you sprinkle it on there and the plants like eat it. They go crazy over it. So I'm gonna try that since we're in auto pots. I think it's gonna be really fun. And of course the last curve ball is we put the Yahweh in the res, which it's literally in there. Only challenge I've had so far, which could be an issue, is there's some rove beetles that have gotten like into the actual auto pot box since our soil is so alive. We'll see if it becomes a problem. So far, it has not been an issue, no flooding, no issues whatsoever, and it's drinking quite a bit. In fact, I'll have to calculate it, but when we first set it up the first like week, it was going through a half a gallon per plant per day, which is like almost 10% by volume. If that's a five gallon, 10% of that would be a half gallon. So it was going through a lot of water compared to some of the other, like the bed, I wasn't putting quite as much in. So it's pretty interesting what happens when you start to sub irrigate, but we'll do this at the very end. I'm excited about it. You can see these are even growing. Like it's just pushing growth out. Look at how healthy that is. All the way under from the lowers. So I need to rip, I need to cut that off. It's just gonna be a waste down here, but I wanted to show you that these plants are so vibrant. They're just trying to grow from everywhere. It's insane. All right, so on here, nutrient wise, I, I've talked about the environment. In fact, I'm gonna revisit it. I'm gonna get my PAR meter. I'm gonna show you where we're at. I'm gonna make some adjustments. The last thing on here was, okay, PPFD, I said nine to 1400, and that will make a DLI, your daily lighting integral. That'll put you between 40 and 60. What do I mean by DLI? DLI is the intensity of the light over how many hours. So if you think of your plants having like a battery of energy, you don't wanna jump charge them. You don't want like a lightning bolt to hit there and that's all the light you get for the day. You wanna trickle charge them slowly so that they have the amount of energy they need. Now, in nature, there's clouds and there's all sorts of things. So they may not get full light all the time. There may be a cloud blocks it, maybe it's a... So they have the ability to work off different ranges of light. When you go outside and you're in summer, in the middle of the day, your par might be 1,000 to 2,000, depending on where you live. So we can tell that's kind of full potency above 1,000. But below that, it gets weird because you might be like, well, I'm only at 900, why are the plants not acting right? Well, 900, if you go 18 hours, that's a lot of light. That raises your DLI number pretty high. But if you're in the right par, like we said, in that 550, that 5600 range, and you're on 18 hours, that puts your DLI in the perfect range. So it's not just the intensity, it's how long you have the intensity. If I'm running 500 par, at 24 hours and I switched to 12 hours to keep the light the same on the DLI, I'd have to double the amount of light. I have to go up to a thousand par. So the time, the time they're on and the potency go together. That's what DLI is. To make it simple, we've put the numbers on here. To make it even more simple, there's a DLI chart and it's color coded where it's like the target zone has the right color. So let's say I'm gonna be at 12 hours of lights on and I wanna be at a certain par. I can go down to my intensity and say, oh, I'm at a thousand PPFD and I'm on for 12 hours. I'll be like, that's 43.2. Bloom transition, 40 to 60, that's good. So that means that number would work at 12 hours on. But if I was at 18 hours on, right? And I go to the same 1000, now I'm at 64.8, way too high. So when you have this chart, you can target a number that makes sense for the stage you're in. Now, greenhouse growers that grow all sorts of plants and flowers and stuff, they know the DLI and they target it appropriately, either using the sun or if they have to supplement lighting, they know they're getting the right DLI. All the, all the special plants at Christmas time, they're all planned very, very specifically. In fact, they do tricks where in the middle of the night, they'll flip the lights on and then flip them off to stop them from flowering. And then when they know the holiday is coming, they'll stop doing it, allowing the plants to full flower so they can sell them for the full, uh, largest amount of money. So this is a very professional way of, of calculating your lighting and how much time it's been on. 
Things that can allow you to take a higher DLI would be higher humidity, better CO2, things that allow you to better use the horsepower. If you've got stagnant air, the temperature's cold, you crank the light up, it's just gonna be burning at both ends. So if it's too cool, you really wanna lower the light because you're not gonna get nutrients fast enough. If it's too warm, you wanna fix that, but you can crank the lights up to deal with some of that, right? As you go deeper in flower, you don't want it too humid, you don't want it too hot because you can get mold. So that's always about the weakest link, but I'm just trying to say they're all interconnected. So when you understand the target environment, plus the intensity of the light, you should have very healthy plants. When you come in and see unhealthy plants, I don't want you to take a picture of the leaf and say, am I missing calcium? I want you to picture everything and go, hmm, is the light on too bright and it's too cold or is it too hot and the light's on too low? Am I off? You can get this chart out and you can see where you should be and see what's the biggest deviation there. It might have an aha moment for you. You might go, oh my God, it's, it's just the lights are way too bright. I didn't know. These new LEDs can go intense. And so if you just jacked your brand new light and you're on 24 hours, your plants are gonna hate you and you're not gonna know why. This will empower you to get it right. So try everything on here first. Besides the 40 to 60 DLI, we're gonna ramp up into the humidity. So we were at 68 to 73%, even higher when you were younger. We wanna be in that 57 to 65% now. And as we actually get buds on there in the flowering fruiting phase after we get past week four, we're gonna drop it to 50 to 40% as we get later. For this first phase though, I'm gonna to wanna to set my app to keep my humidity in between 57 and 65%. So I'm just gonna shoot for 60%. That means if it drops below 60%, this will kick on. And then what I'll do is I have fresh air coming in all the time, but if the temperature gets too high in here, my exhaust will kick on and it'll suck the air out. My goal is to keep my temperature setting about where the lights occasionally trigger the heat. If, my, if it's too cold in here and my exhaust is set on temperature, it'll never turn on. So there's different things to consider, but if your exhaust is only triggered on temperature, you gotta make sure it gets warm enough occasionally to trigger it so you have that exhaust happening. Otherwise, I can set it on timer. I can set it on other parameters. The NIWA gives you lots of control, but that's how I'm doing it. I'm having 100% constant filtered air coming in the back corner over here, and it's just coming in. I've got a tube down low. It just blows in and it kind of circulates in here always. And the reason why is if these plants are growing really fast and the air is not moving, they're going to use the CO2 right around their leaf pretty quickly. So when the air is moving, it brings no, new CO2 near the leaf and they can use it but when that runs out, I could suffocate them. So we're constantly bringing fresh air in. It was really cold out and I didn't have the lights cranked and I was bringing in too much fresh air and it was lowering the temperature in here. When I lowered the temperature, it lowered the amount of nutrients these could uptake and I had the light a little high. So when I fixed it with Kowoko, I fixed by slowing down the air that was coming in so that it didn't lower the temperature in here. And I added the Yahweh to the res. It just seemed like these blew up. And so all of that little tip burn is starting to go away on the new growth. Some of it we're gonna have to live with. You can see it like tried to grow back out of it now that it's all corrected. Some of the leaves, like I left some of these on because they're just so beautiful, even all the way down low. The health, the sheen. So we're starting to get what we want out of the auto pots, which means I know it's possible. And this is our first try. So I think we can get better at this and this might be totally viable. The other thing I heard is that they're making a bigger system with fabric pots, which would be all the build a soil way. And I'm excited to try that. Maybe I could even use the grassroots with like the plastic liner. Anyways, we're always gonna tinker. For right now, for the bloom transition, it, it has all these things. Now, all of this could be done all at once, or you could break it down into like two or three different days. The whole goal is at least once in that week to hit this. So on the first one on here is a wedding agent, the J Plant Speaker Q Yaha. I like to do that because it spreads the moisture. You don't have to use a wedding agent, but I like to, so that's on here. Next, Rootwise Microbe Complete. That is up until the bloom. So we're about to switch now to Biofoss. And so now under the flower, bloom transition, it says switch over to the Biofoss, the new record for world record pumpkins in North America. This is the only new product he added to his lineup this year. Lots of other products he uses, but this is the only one new and he broke the record. And he was telling Kevin about some of the reasons why we'll explain what he saw from the product. But one of the things he saw was better flower set. And that's really what we're after right now when we're about to start stacking. So I'm gonna start using this for sure. Besides that is I'm gonna use the RootWise enzymes, okay, together. And so on here it says RootWise and it goes to, on micro complete it says zero. That's because we're now to bloom transition. And so then, but if you go down further, BioFoss, which you can see this if you download your own, it says to use a half teaspoon. So I'm gonna do that per gallon. 
Now the next thing on here is Big Six Micros. I'm not adding it today, but I will add it to, uh, probably tomorrow or the next day. So just because you don't see it in the first go, I do another watering later in the week. I will add that. I like to make sure micronutrients are good before we flip to flour. It's important that just like anything going through a hormonal change that's gonna be really putting off a lot of new growth, I wanna make sure it has everything that it needs, all the building blocks. So the big six micronutrients I'll be using. Next, it says on here, for the bloom transition, eighth cup more, one time only. So don't keep top dressing, but if you need it, you can top dress craft blend and you can use some build a flower. Since these beds are pretty big, I may not do it, but looking at the size of what's about to come out here, this week I'm probably gonna throw some handfuls near each plant kind of side dressed of craft blend and build a flower, but not today. Next on here is Kashi blend. That'll go along with it to help break it down. Next we have build a soil EM5. I mentioned that you wanna have some sort of way to clean your plants. Call it IPM if you will. It's not a pesticide, but it's a way to keep anything from growing, keep any bacteria, keep any bugs where it's just not hospitable to them. And so our EM5 is my favorite way to do it. It's got organic apple cider vinegar. It's got organic grape alcohol. It's got essential oil that's organic. And so if you were to look up all the best home recipes, those are some of the best ingredients and we've made it easy. And I'm gonna mix some of that and I'm gonna foliar spray these one last time to clean them up, but I'm gonna do it after I defoliate. So I'm not gonna do that today. Today, I'm just gonna show you what I'm doing. Then I'll defoliate. Then next time I get to foliar spray the EM5 to make sure during stretch it's all clean and I'll be doing the top dress and anything else like the big six. Okay, next on my list here is the pure protein dry or some soy aminos. I like to, right in transition, do a foliar spray of some aminos. It helps really give them that free energy, especially when they're gonna be utilizing it during stretch. It doesn't, it means they don't have to work for it for that day and all that energy can be used to grow new plant and also mine roots deeper to get more minerals and micronutrients and everything else needed. So kind of like a protein shake, since we're about to go do a big workout, I wanna make sure that they have all the energy needed. I will be doing that, but not today. Today, I'm just gonna do this. Then later, I'm gonna go through and do that foliar spray. You can actually add the aminos with the EM5 and do it both at once. I like to do it separate. So I'm just gonna do it separate. I've got lots of times I can interact in here. In fact, some of you reach out to me and say, this method is so easy. I'm bored, what do I do? I'm looking for ways to tinker. The way you can tinker is by separating this out to different days so that you've got something to look forward to each day if that's really what you wanna do. But if you're too busy, you can combine it all into one day if needed. Next, I've got the um, Rootwise Biofoss. I already mentioned I'm gonna use that. Then on here, aloe vera, we stop and we switch to coconut. And so I think I grabbed some coconut here today. No, no coconut today, but I will add that. I've um, just got the J plant speaker and the Biofoss and the enzymes. Then you go down further. Now it's color coded because you don't always have to use all of this. This is just, if we were to recommend everything, how you would use it. So if I keep going, the next one on here is the build -a bloom which I will be adding a little bit later this week. I wanna get all the biology in there. I wanna kick it off and then I'll give it a little bit of food later. Uh, but what I am gonna do is add some ferments. And so the very last item on here is you could use comfrey or hemp, pumpkin or peach. And then in this transition, it uses a little bit of both. So what I'm gonna do is switch it up. I've got some peach and this one says two ounces per gallon. So I'm gonna do that. And then I'm also gonna add some sprouted quinoa to ferment because sprouted quinoa is full of proteins and I think it's gonna be really nutritious. It's a little bit of like the veg formula with the bloom formula. And since we're in transition, I'm gonna use both, two ounces of each in my watering. I'm gonna use Rootwise, Enzymes, and Q. That's all I'm gonna add to both these beds. Then later in the week, I'm gonna top dress, I'm gonna foliar spray aminos, and then after all that, I'm gonna clean it all off with EM5. All during this week, week one of bloom transition. Now I've got four weeks that I'm gonna be living in this cycle. You could do the EM5 each week. You know, you can use the EM5 all the way through week four. Some people use it further. I'm probably gonna stop after one application because it's really nice in here. I've got no pests, molds, bugs, but you, if you're brand new, might wanna do it at least once a week until week three or four to make sure you don't have any issues, okay? That's everything that's on my chart. Coconut water's on here. Really, it's all here. The environment, the explanation for if you don't have these products, what they are. Very last on the bottom, we have optional compost tea with ingredients from above. Alternatively, you can go to Google, just go to Google and type in build a soil compost tea we have a few basic recommendations that we've been taught over the years and why. We also have a section on here for harvest and curing that goes over the parameters. But of course, when we harvest, we're gonna go over it in great detail because it's one of the most important parts of the process. Mention something, the temperature for VPD. So we went over DLI, that's the intensity of the light and the length the light is on. Another number you see on there is a VPD, vapor pressure deficit. It's essentially the temperature and the humidity. You can see the humidity just kicked on. 
When the humidity is high, the plants are able to open their stomata, receive the light without getting dried out. But if the humidity is too low, the plant, when it opens to receive light, it starts to get dried out. So now it has to use energy to move water constantly and transpire that water to keep in a happy state. It's almost like you're in a desert and you're running. You need to be drinking more water than ever. So it'd be better to put you in not a desert and slow down your running. Then you wouldn't go through so much. So VPD is the pressure that the lack of humidity puts on the plants. And what we wanna do is when we have seedlings or clones, no pressure. So we have very high humidity relative to the temperature. The plants can literally never get dried out. They just enjoy life, they veg. And one of the things you'll notice is that this extreme growth since the last time we defoliated was because we have high humidity and lower light, according to our chart, that just takes the pressure off the plants and lets them rage with vegetative growth, two to three times as fast as not following our protocol. But when we go to flower, although it would produce very fast, abundant of growth, it can mold. So we're gonna start to taper down on the humidity and we also wanna make sure that the VPD is on point because that's the temperature to humidity. So let me get the chart. On here it says VPD, as we go into bloom transition, should be 1.2 to 1.5. And that's a formula you can look up on a VPD chart, just like the DLI chart. And you go, I'm at this temperature, what's my humidity, what's my VPD? As long as it's in that 1.2 to 1.5, you're good. You can actually set that on the NIWA, which is where my chart lives, so I'll show you that. But that temperature is based off of this, not the environmental temperature. The good news is with LEDs, your leaf surface temperature should be pretty similar to your environmental temperature. But the most accurate reading is by reading the leaf and seeing that that's 67 degrees. It's too cool, right? And so at 67 degrees, if I think it's 75, I'm gonna base VPD off that. Now the door's open right now. That's why it's cool. I've also got the lights dimmed down just a little bit because I don't want it to be too hot in here that's not good enough. 67 degree is just too cool. I want the VPD to be higher. So right where the lights are actually hitting, 67, too cold. And so I'm gonna make sure I warm it up a little bit. Now if it's 80 in here, but my leaf is 75, 75 is the number I'm gonna use for my VPD. I'm not gonna use the 80. The reason it's important is LEDs, they don't push heat straight to the leaf. You're not gonna get as fast a growth. You're gonna be like, well, it's 70 degrees, 75. Why isn't this working? Well, your leaf might be 60. When we used to use the, the thousand waters and the HPSs, they would womp heat straight down, kind of like the sun. You'd feel it and the leaf would feel it. So you'd come in here and go, man, it's 75. Why are there plants burning? And you'd go right underneath your light and go, oh my God, the leaf's 100 degrees. And so you, need, you needed to get the leaf surface temperature to base your formulas off of. When everything's dialed, it's, it's pretty even. It might be five degrees difference or something. But right now it's cold outside. So when I dumped the tent, it really lowered the temperature. And although there's a little bit of warmth from here, most of the warmth comes off the top and the fans move it out. So you need to be aware. When I'm looking at that cold of a temperature, I'm thinking it's not gonna take nutrients up as much as it needs. So if I crank the lights to full strength and the temperature stays the same, it's, not, it's gonna be wonky. The good news is when I crank the lights, it's gonna add more heat so long as I don't take it out too fast. So getting your averages, you can use a, just a regular temperature and humidity reader and reset it and it'll tell you the high and the low. So if you don't have an entire environmental control, your job is to clear it, set it in your grow room, and every day check it and see what was the high last night, what was the low last night. And if your low is like 50 degrees, you're like, man, in the middle of the day, why? Or if your high at night is really high, that high low will give you the information you need. But if you happen to have a NIWA or a fully connected greenhouse or grow controller, you can get charts and you can see how everything goes up and down in temperature. And the idea is to start to control that flow so you don't have jacked highs and jacked lows. Plants don't like it. They're like babies. They like to be on that even keel. So um, that's what we're gonna be using. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be doing more readings in here because I've had the tent door open and everything, but the goal will be to come in and get good readings on everything and make sure I'm calculating the DLI properly. And it's a little bit too cold in here. So that'll be one of my primary goals. I will do that in the app. So let me grab it. N-I-W-A, this is the Grow Hub. You can see Grow Hub 2, the lights are on, the fans on right now. And we are at 80.4 degrees in here at 82% humidity. And so the reading is a little off because it's right here where it's transpiring, so the humidity will be a little high. As I flip to flower, I'll actually pull this and I'll make sure that it's in a target zone that's a little bit better. I might even move it out from under the light, but right now that's giving me a pretty good reading of that canopy, which should be similar to all of them. Loading my recipes, 10, 10 by 10, season four. And now what I can do is edit it. And it's gonna be like, are you sure this is a live recipe? Yes. 
Okay, so I can continue. I can change all the settings. I just keep it basic. Right now it's at 6 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. So it's on for 18 hours and it's off for six. I'm gonna go change that right now. Okay, so 6 a.m., 6 p.m. That's now for 12 hours. That's the light cycle, okay? Perfect. Watering, I don't have any water pumps, so I'm not gonna mess with that. In a previous season, I did do a water pump and that's why I had that on there. Climate, this is important. Look at how dialed in they have. You could do temp and relative humidity, relative humidity and VPD, or temp and VPD because one controls the other. I'm gonna do temp and humidity and I'm gonna see how it targets VPD, which I can't control right here. But if I go to my chart, you'll see that I wanna target right here at the, let's see, 1.2 to 1.5 is where I wanna be. So let's adjust it. Now, what I told you is I want it warmer in here so that I can keep everything going, mainly because the leaf surface is not gonna be as warm. So I'm gonna have my target temp be 85 degrees in here. I think that's gonna be really good. I'll start to lower that as we go deeper in flower, but remember, the leaf surface is not gonna be that hot. Target humidity, if I keep it at 70%, it's gonna be at 1.22. I'm gonna go down to 65%, that's 1.43. That's outside the range. So if you look on here, and it says 57 to 65%, that's because I have temperature of 70 to 80. But that's supposed to be off the leaf surface temperature. So what I'm saying is I'm gonna go here. Now you can do an offset in here. So I'm gonna say I want it to be on 85 for everything in here. But I wanna have my VPD be based off the leaf surface temperature. So I can actually go in here and set some leaf temperature offsets and control it. But I know I wanna be at 85 because I don't think it's gonna be that hot there. So let me show you what I really wanna do. I wanna probably be in like this range where it's 78 right on the leaf and it's 60 at my humidity. That puts me at 1.3, which is exactly where I wanna be. Well, I want my leaf to be 78. So I'm gonna bump this up to 85, so that's likely to happen. I'll come in and I'll take a leaf temperature and then I can set the number of degrees offset in here. Then I'm always using the leaf temperature instead of the room temperature. So 85 degrees in here, should be about 77 there on the leaf, not on the whole plant, but at least the top. And then the target humidity will be at 60% for right now. So I'm dropping that down. It was a lot higher humidity in here. That'll put me at 1.6 VPD. That's not true. It's probably gonna be about 1.2 to 1.3 based on the leaf surface temperature. Now that that's right, cycle two. So that's from 6 a.m. to 11.59. I wanna change this because I wanna have a different environment under lights off. So let's change that right now. I'm gonna to go to 6 p.m. just like my lights. Okay, 6.03 p.m., hit done. That gives me a few minutes where there's no overlap. That's better for the computers. And if you try and do it like at two minutes or one minute, it tells you you should have two or three minutes in there. Now, 6.03 p.m., I'm gonna end this 11.59 p.m. Then what I'm gonna do is at midnight or 12.02, I'm gonna start another cycle that goes to 6 a.m. That's how you cover the middle of the night on an app like that. So I've got that from six to midnight. And now what I wanna do is take my target temp down because I want it to be cooler at night. So I'm gonna set my temp to 65. I, it's never gonna get 65 probably in here, but what it's gonna do is trigger my exhaust to just be on all the time. That way we have fresh air and it doesn't get built up with like too much moisture in here. Then what I'm gonna do is my target humidity at 50. That way, as it's sucking the air out, if the humidity starts to drop, this will kick on, but I don't want it to just have 80% humidity because I don't control that at night. Some people only control during lights on and they forget at night's important too. Now, here's the thing. VPD doesn't matter at night because there's no light on, so it doesn't really matter, but I don't want it to be like bone dry, whipped with wind and have all these issues. I want it to be just nice. And as I get deeper in flower, I don't want it to be warm or wet in here while it's sitting stagnant because you can get bud rot. So I try and mimic nature, warmer during the day, cooler at night. If you ever find yourself in a grow where you're running lights at night to keep up with energy, and all of a sudden your lights are off during the day and it's 100 degrees during the day, but it's only 80 degrees during your grow at night, you don't want to invert those. You want to keep it cooler at night, warmer during the day whenever possible. So that's what I recommend. They now have ventilation settings where you can be minutes on per hour. So right now I don't have my ventilation on for a certain number of minutes per hour, but I could switch that. Right now I'm gonna keep it on a high temperature. So my fan is already set to be done when a certain temperature hits. But in the recipe, I can use that same fan to vent a certain number of minutes per hour, just like I thought, because I do wanna keep CO2 going, I wanna keep the air moving. And Niwa keeps updating their app with these ideas that you can fully control it. I know I went over a lot and I know the apps changed a little bit, but it keeps getting better. So if you have questions specifically about this, since I've kind of jumped around, post them in here. I'll make sure I do an FAQ on it or I do a deeper dive on environment. The other place that we have is thebuildasoilway.com. 
We're hoping to put more of these educational videos. Maybe I can do whiteboard. I'm gonna be replacing some of the older videos there, but they'll be more educational where these are live with plants. And I think it'll be good to do a deep dive there where I can really go over the formulas underlying here because there's a math formula that gives you the DLI if you know the two numbers. You don't have to use a chart. So I'll go over all that stuff with you. For now, what I wanna do is finally just set this. So I've got the climate where I want. I've got all of the different things saved. I'm gonna hit finish and save. Everything's now reset. I'm now in my flowering recipe so I can see the details. I can see the lights are from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and I've confirmed it. And now when I go here and I actually go back to the grow, you can see the stats. So there's my lights off time. You can see the temperature. You can see everything here, relative humidity, temperature, the light. Now that's gonna be 12 hours and I can verify everything that's going on the entire time, which is really cool. So you can go back like a month and see how it's been in here. You can go back for the last six hours. You can go back for a day and you can see everything. There's a week. And if you know you've got it right, you can check this and you can watch it all and dial in your parameters. That's how you dial in a grill. So pretty stoked. This has been a good episode. We've kicked it off two flower. We kicked the males off two flower. I showed you the parameters. And if you can't remember, I've written it all down. So you can go get this schedule. You can go get the DLI chart. You can go get the VPD chart. You can go buy your own little laser reader so you can read your own leaf temperature and know that you're doing it right. And now you know everything that's behind the scenes. So instead of going, well, it feels good in here, right? Now you know for sure. So if you start to see leaf tip up top, you're like, wow, my light must be on too bright. I never thought of that, but I looked at the DLI. I was off the chart or the opposite. Man, they're not growing very fast. Wow, my light is really weak. Maybe I should get a new one. This is how you know without being sold. You have data that verifies it. You know you can solve a problem and you go fix it, whether through me or some other vendor. But if someone just goes, you need this, it's bright. What if your other light's already good enough for your environment? It may not be the weakest link. It may be that you need to add humidity and you need fresh airflow and now your light's gonna crush. So when you have all the parts, you can solve the Rubik's Cube, if that makes sense. I've got scissors in my pocket. I wanna wrap this episode up because it's going long, but I, I do wanna talk a little bit about what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come in and defoliate. This one, like it may never make it, but it, especially with those there. So what I'll do is I first big fan then when I've big fan, I've decided, do I tuck this out the side? Do I keep this one? What do I do? And I, every decision is gonna be unique. And the only way you learn is by going through this process and then after you make these decisions, watching. Typically when you're new, you take off a little less going, mm, I think I took too much, I don't wanna hurt the plant. And then two days later, it's overgrown again. Then as you get better, you kind of, sometimes you go a little hard and you're still surprised how quick it comes back. But this plant wasn't touching the screen and I was able to bend some of the tops in the last video, it now hit the screen in more than one top. So it did its job adjusting the hormones. A lot of these big leaves just need to go. So the first thing I'm gonna do in here is expose all of the big leaves. Then I'm gonna take a look at the number of tops and then I'm gonna decide, do I need to push this top down, pull it further over in the screen, pull it outside the screen? And then last but not least, all these little things need to go down here. You get, look at under there, see all the dead leaves from the last video? They break down pretty quickly, but all these need to go. So I'll be pulling all those off, everything underneath the screen, like this little one right here, probably not worth it. I'd rather leave the top if I'm gonna keep it, but not the little sides. So I'll come strip them fully down, I'll big leaf it, that'll open up a light flow and airflow in here, like the light will hit all the tops, and then I'll have to look at it and decide, like is this one too tall? What I could do is push it down and pull it out the side to keep it even. That might leave more room for some to come up. That's it, you'll see what I did when I come back next. Over here, it's a little bit more of a jungle, but the leaves aren't so big and it's getting some good penetration. So I'm gonna come in and do something similar. I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna big leaf a little bit. And then once I'm done with all the big leafing, I'm gonna see are there any other tops like this one that could be exposed without the light blocking it. And I'll make sure that that's good. Now, if this one's too tall, I might bend it and pull it over, but I kind of already filled the screen at this point. This one went so fast. If I need to start controlling tops now, I need another screen on here. That's it. At this point, now that I've flipped a flower, I'm just gonna literally watch it grow, manage the height. So um, I'll do a par reading to wrap it up. I wanna show you here. And then the last thing that I can do is adjust the light. So if I want it to be warmer in here, and if the light's too potent, instead of me dimming it where it keeps it cool in here, I could raise the light, crank it a little more, and that'll add some heat. But it may not be the most energy efficient. You can get them lower and you could put a heater in here. There's so many ways to overcome the challenges you just have to know the parameters so you can control it on your own. 
I think this is a little too close because I want to get spread all the way out here. And you can tell it was a little bit intense because the leaf color here got a little bit diminished where on the sides it's beautiful. So if I were to measure the par there at the intensity I had, it's growing into it a little bit fast. And so I want to make sure that I raise the light to keep it more even spread. That'll be the last thing that I do in here. In fact, as soon as we're done and I wrap it up, I'm going to get my step stool in here before it gets overgrown. I'm going to raise it as high as it goes, all these lights. And then I'll use the intensity to keep the light in the right PPFD, which gets me in the right DLI for 12 hours. So I'll grab my par meter and I'll show you that before I leave. And that'll be how we wrap it up. I've got a full chapin. I'm going to add root wise. Okay, biofoss, very important. I'm going to switching over to flour. I've got two different ferments and I've got my Kuyaha. That's all I'm adding in the water. I'm gonna get it to both these beds. Over here, what I wanna do is try this for fun. Let's do it right now. You can see I've got feeder roots literally ready to take everything that, that I can throw at it. They love the Colorado Worm Company. And the reason why I chose the Kooko is it holds water really well. It's got like a nice water holding capacity to it and it's made this top zone be more moist where it was drying out too fast before. The other thing that's helped is it's filled in the canopy. So now the light isn't hitting here and it's staying nice and moist and that's stimulating those feeder roots. I've got a little quarter teaspoon thing here. I would like to have something bigger, but that's what I had. So I'm just going to go hard. That's like a teaspoon. And I'm just going to kind of go around the edges here like this. So there's like a teaspoon, get another super scooper. Just on all these feeder roots. Pretty cool. That's it. I'm just going to top dress that. That'll start to slowly moisten and it won't look like that soon. I can always hit it with just a little spray but I'm gonna see what the roots do. Alex grows some fire, probably because of his castings, right? But we all have our own little skills and this is one thing he said has made a huge difference. So I'm stealing the tech. Alex, thank you for the idea. Organics Alive, thanks for the product. This is the, the one that I'm using today is the 455. He mentioned using the finishing one at the end of flower, Alex did, but I feel like these auto pots are gonna need nutrients. And this doesn't take much space. I've already packed it full of Kooko. So this is new to me and I'm, I'm having fun doing it. We'll see how it all works. About two teaspoons each. We'll see what that turns into. We'll see how the plants respond. If it becomes something that works, we'll mention it more later. Wow, some of these lowers are really popping in. I think this is gonna be a pretty fun grow. Besides that tip burn issue that we had, I really think it's coming out of it. I need to go through. There's lots of big leaves that just need to be pulled off. When I'm done going through here, same as that, I've gotta decide, do I tuck any of these out to the side? Do I put another screen on? Because I think this is just gonna rage. I'm gonna raise that light all the way up. I'm gonna raise those two lights all the way up. I'm gonna finish defoliating to kind of illustrate the point. Grab the par meter. You don't have to use this one. We're gonna carry a cheaper one, but this is, I wanna use the best if we're gonna document it for you guys. This is the Apogee meter. Works on full spectrum lighting, which is great, like we're using here. And so this is the PPFD or the par reading that you'd get. And you can see right here, I've got it about 400. Lights dimmed a little bit, like I said, that's why the leaf surface temperature was a little bit cold because it, was, it gets too hot and bright in here if all the lights are on while we're recording. Now, if I go to my chart and we're in veg, because I was, I'm just switching now. Let's say we're in pre-bloom. I said, hey, let's get the PPD at 550 to 700, the par, and that'll put our DLI in 30 to 40 as long as we're on for 16 hours. Well, I was on for 18 hours, so I don't need it quite 5, 50 to 700. I can be probably 500 to 600. And I'm a little lower than that. I've actually had it slightly higher and that's why they're vegging so fast. But now that I'm flipping the flower, I would actually need to brighten it up a bit. I'm going to lift the light. So this isn't where I'll leave it, but that's as low as setting. When I go to bright, you can tell now I'm at eight, 900, right? That's 850. Depending on where you go, it gets bright. So since if I'm in that range that far away, and I'm only on that 16 hours, that might be a little bit too much for the beginning. It says at week one through four, you could be nine to 1400, but you wanna make sure, like I said, for quality and plants you've not grown before on the lower end. So I'm gonna try and stick to 900. And I like to kind of ramp it up slowly. So for the first day of flower, since it's not really on flower yet, it doesn't know yet, the lights haven't shut off. I'm gonna keep it a little bit lower but I'm gonna jack the lights to do that, then probably turn it full on. Then tomorrow, I'm gonna to make sure our minimum is 900 across the board, so I follow the chart according to the plan. Over here, it's cranked down a little bit, same thing. We're at 500 here, 550. So if I were to crank this one, it's gonna be similar. It's just gonna be off the charts, 1200, 1100, 1000. So I'll need to dim that if I kept it there, but I'm gonna raise it up. We'll see where the numbers land, and that should be really helpful. Tomorrow is its first official day of flower, 
and we'll just watch them stretch. If they get too tall, I'll throw another net on and bend them. And that's it. We'll follow the chart the rest of the way. Not much more work to do besides the last defoliation, but you can tell they took to the last one really well. Filled up, even though I obviously stripped them pretty hard. This has been most impressive. I mean, I didn't think we we're gonna fill a whole quadrant with these little pots, but it's happened. And so I can't wait to show you the flowers. We've never grown the Soleil Levant. We've never grown the Fruit by the Funk. We've never grown the Royal Black Dog Kush. So lots to look forward to, including the auto flowers. And I will tally up some yield weights now that we've harvested all four. I'll bring some of the finished flower back in and show you some nug shots. And that's everything. Today's a big day. Flip to flower. Thank you so much. I appreciate you watching. Hit like, hit subscribe, tell your friends about this stuff. If you've got questions, ask them because we do frequently ask questions videos and we want to include yours so we can help more people with your questions. I will see you guys on the next build a soil episode.